I'm Greg Mays, the founder and executive director of Harlem Presents. We're a Harlem-based and focused nonprofit with a mission of providing free cultural entertainment for the village of Harlem. One of our signature programs is the Harlem Opera Festival, a multi-night festival that provides a large public stage for emerging opera singers, primarily of color. That festival usually takes place in July in Harlem's historic Marcus Garvey Park and features, in alternating years, the winners of the annual vocal competitions of the Harlem Opera Theater and Opera Ebony. Each of those vocal competitions presents classical singers, ages 23 to 35. When the pandemic hit New York City in the spring, our initial hope was that we'd still be able to present the festival in July. When the pandemic lingered, we then thought we'd simply have to delay the festival until late summer. When those hopes were dashed, we hoped to present the festival as late as the fall. Unfortunately, the parks never reopened to large groups, so we were forced to abandon the traditional presentation of the Harlem Opera Festival. At that point, necessity once again became the mother of invention. We began a conversation with the Harlem Opera Theater, this year's artistic partner, that ended with the decision to present a live stream of their annual vocal competition. They too had their programming interrupted by the pandemic. Two weekends ago, witnessed the close to the public semi-final round of the vocal competition, conducted via Zoom. This afternoon, all of the competition's finalists have assembled here at the spectacularly renovated Harlem School of the Arts and will sing for judges, also here with us, whom you'll meet later. It would be remiss of me to not mention the funders who have made this live stream possible. They include the Upper Manhattan Empowerment Zone, the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, the New York State Council on the Arts, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the West Harlem Development Corporation. Please enjoy these wonderful young singers and watch their careers as they continue to bloom. Thank you for joining. everyone and uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon those of us uh, those of you live streaming this program thank you for being here thank you to everyone who is in this room right now 
Um, it's a little bit different this year. We're doing things a little bit differently. Um, it's 2020. This is the way of the world right now. I promise you, I am smiling under this mask. I've got a big smile. Um, this is something I look forward to uh, since I was here last year. So this was something I was looking forward to this year. And I'm sure all of our contestants we're also, are also looking forward to it and have been looking forward to it. Um, a quick round of thank yous first to the Harlem Opera Theater for having me yet again as your hostess for this afternoon. My name is Naomi Yane. Uh, we're going to have a great show. We've got a great show planned out for you. So sit back and relax. So again, thank you to the Harlem Opera Theater for having me this year um, in this beautiful space, uh, really, uh, at the uh, Herb Alberts Alpert Center. Beautiful space. Um, and uh, we hope you enjoy this show. Uh, throughout the uh, program, please keep in mind that you can make donations. You can also vote for your favorite contestant. You can also follow along on the program. So if you're streaming via YouTube, maybe you're streaming via the Facebook Live, you can find that information on there. So please feel free to do that and make donations. And of course, put in your votes for your favorite contestant. And of course, be sure to follow along with the program. So I, won't, I promise not to ever keep you too long and with too much rambling, we're gonna go ahead and move the show right along and we're going to bring to you to the stage our first contestant of the afternoon, Carlene Waugh. She's a soprano and we will bring her up right now. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Carleen. Thank you. The judges would love to hear your rendition of Guide My Feet, arranged by Jacqueline Hairston.
thank you very much, Ms. Wah. Thank you. Shall I? Carlene, stay with us for a second. Yeah, stay with us. We're going to chat. Can we get you a mic? Let's get her a mic. You can hear me okay from here, right? Yes. We're going to keep it safe. We're going to chat for two seconds while the judges deliberate and chit chat amongst themselves. Your voice has been described as powerful, and that was powerful indeed. My goodness, over here with chills. Now, as I was reading your bio, it says, you know, you're of Jamaican descent. Um, and one of the goals of the, um, of the uh, Harlem Opera Theater is to give opportunities and showcase opera in places where we don't normally see it, let's say. Now, I'm Congolese from Central Africa, and like a lot of you know African families and Caribbean families, we're you know we're not really pushed towards the arts. Let's say a lot of times it's you know be doctors, be lawyers, and that's usually the case. How did you or when were you exposed to opera, and how did you know that this was something you wanted to pursue? Well, growing up in Jamaica, I um, enjoyed music. Um, we I I went to St. Catherine High School. I sang in choirs and stuff like that, um, and I found that I just really in enjoyed music but I also I enjoyed singing but I enjoyed the the outlet that it provided for communication through you know to to a wider audience um, so I decided I, I came I started I started studying a little bit later um, but I decided you know this this is what I wanted to do and how did what did that look like in support from your family, from your peers? <laughs> well, in Jamaica, you know, everybody hears about, you know, Bob Marley, reggae music, all of that. Um, but I decided to do classical music, which um, we have some wonderful classical, classical musicians coming out of Jamaica, but it's still not very completely pop popular, right? Mm. So, um, it was it was different. Let's just say that it was a little <laughs> bit different. Right. Um, but you know, I I feel like I was guided. You know, in in I had wonderful teachers who encouraged me. Mm. Um, and yeah, with the help, you know, it takes a village basically. Absolutely. So with the help of all my teachers and everyone, um, I I was able to come here and study. Excellent. Thank you so much for having us. Good luck to you. Thank, Thank you, you for, so much for, for, for chatting with me. I'll let you go now as Absolutely. we move the show along. Thank you. All right. Excellent. So I'm going to, I always promise that I'll, I won't talk too long um, because I'm a talker, I'm a journalist, this is what we do. So I, I, I can get long-winded sometimes, but I promise I will not do that today. I promise to keep this show rolling so we can stay on time. Um, we've got our next performer coming up to the stage. We've got Joanne Evans, who is a mezzo-soprano. Thank you. 
chat for a second you'll tell me a little bit about yourself and I always want to know I find um, you know classical music um, you know it's not I, I, I'm, 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 I'm seeing that more young people are into it and interested and in wanting to, to to sing and be in, you know involved in this genre of music and I always want to know what was your first exposure great question <laughs> I don't really know yeah. Um, I remember the first transformative experience of seeing um, two young people sing this thing that I thought was for old white-haired people that I would never <laughs> be interested in. Um, I saw this production of The Tempest screened at the Met in the cinema and more than being about the music for me, it's always about this superhuman feet that this sound can come out of a person's face and mm. be that loud. Mm. That's always why I, I come back to it. Mm. So how did you know that that sound could come out of your face? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't and I don't, um, <laughs> but I'm working on it. Um, I had a lot of singing lessons. I'm still having a lot of singing lessons. Uh, I sang a lot of pop as a child, a mm. lot of Spice Girls, a lot of Stevie Wonder. And <laughs> here we are over a process of many, many years. Excellent. Thank you very much, Miss Evans. The judges would like to hear your other aria from Marta. Okay, the next piece we're going to perform is Nimmer mir wird mein Herze from Flotov's Marta.
Thank you very much, Ms. Evans. We're very fortunate enough to have in this program the second offering from an African-American female composer, and we want to hear it. Okay, great. It's my pleasure to present this final song, which is Out of the South Blew a Wind by Florence Price. <laughs> Yet again, we'll get a mic up here for you. Tell us a little, tell us a little bit about your final selection and why you chose that piece. Yeah, um, this year has been, I think, the start of an even larger conversation for a lot of us who were, definitely myself, ignorant of so many accomplished black composers and composers of color. Um, I'm lucky to be studying somewhere um, where there's a bit of an expert of Florence Price's music. So I went to them and they helped me with this beautiful piece. Um, and hopefully it's the start of a lot of my learning of Florence Price's music. I think it's so unusual, so ahead of its time. Excellent, and that brings up the conversation about representation um, and seeing that more. And um, you know, what moved you? What, I mean, what, what moves you about it? I think I'm drawn immediately to any composer that is a woman, which is why I went straight for Florence Price. Um, I'm moved by her music especially because it's so varied. She doesn't have one set style. If I sung another song of hers, you could think it was by a different composer. And I think that speaks to just how brilliant she was and how, how much breadth there was in her talent and her writing. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll take your mic. We'll move the show right along. And for our, for our, our, our viewers who are streaming this from home, be sure to you know, share the link with folks. It's a perfect day to stay in and watch a sh uh, uh, an awesome show. Uh, we've got some very talented folks lined up today, so be sure to like, be sure to share, be sure to invite your friends to watch from their homes safely as we are doing it here today. We are also here being safe. This is the way of the world right now. We're gonna go ahead and move the show right along. Coming up next to the stage, Joshua Conyers, and he is a baritone. So as we wait for Joshua to make his way up here, get excited, awesome.
to begin with Si Può, Signore, Signori, from Pagliacci by Leon Cavallo. Si può, si può, signore, signori, scusatemi, se dal sol mi presento, io sono il pro. Te vorrei prendere la vecchia usanza e a voi di nuovo in via mi. Ma non per dirvi come prima le lacrime che noi versiamo sono false dei spasimi e dei nostri martiri non allarvatevi no no l'autore ha cercato in vece pingervi uno squarcio di vita e vi ha fermato il massore che l'artista è un uomo
concetto mi dissi, or ascoltate come mi hai svolto, andiamo in camera già. chat for a while. We'll get a mic up here for you. I don't know about everyone else. I mean, the folks who are streaming from home, your expressions, you can probably show them because you're safely in your home. We're here. We have to wear masks. So I'm just going to tell you guys, like, there's a lot of excitement for sure, on for sure. my face. So just so you know. Now, I'm reading your bio and you've got a long list of credits. You know, you've had a really nice career so far and it's been great, I'm sure. What has been your favorite role, let's say, and why? Ooh. <laughs> if you can pick. All right, yeah, yeah actually, actually, yes, yeah, actually, actually had this conversation a short while ago and yeah. I think it would have to be Falstaff from Verdi's Falstaff. It's his last show. And I think he just put a, a wonderful like period on his wonderful career um, as a composer. And it was it's something it's the role itself. It's 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 not about so much the voice. He really wanted and you know an actor singer, and it stretches me to just go beyond my voice. Um, you know, I get to play around. I get to play this big you know over the top knight who's very sloppy, very very mean and rude. And uh, he has a lot of fun. Um, so it's, it's a lot of fun on stage. It's a long night. It's a hard night. But uh, yeah, that definitely has to be my favorite. So how do you prepare for that when it's, uh, when, when it's a night like that? Well, first, you, you, mean, you have to, you know, you learn how to, how to pace yourself. You know, um, you know, we try, you know, when, when the emotions are going, like we're given and we're given. And, you, you know, you have to realize, you have to, you know, tell yourself that, you know, pace yourself. It's a long night. You don't have to go 100%. <laughs> all night for three hours long and uh, you know use your other things use your your nuance use your acting use your face use your body um, to give all the emotions and so you know you, you start to, as you do it more and more you start to learn those things and I've, luckily I've had a, a lot of wonderful teachers who helped me along the way to accomplish those goals. Excellent. Um, if you had if, if there is maybe you played it already is there a role of a lifetime a goal something that you're looking to hit you know, before you put a, something that you would use to put the period on your career? Ooh, um, goodness. Uh, well, I, I would love uh, to do Aida. Uh, Amanazaro would be amazing. Uh, Rigoletto would be another. And uh, I love Puccini, just like as a listener. Uh, so anything like that, Bohem, all of those things. And one of my all-time favorite is Porgy and Bess, too. So if I ever get a chance to, you know, I, I got to be in the chorus and covered a couple times, but ever get a chance to sing Porgy, I would love to do that, yeah. Judges? Thank you, Naomi and Joshua. We would like to hear both of your selections. Please choose the order that you would love to sing them in. And a question from me. How many times have you heard you're a tenor? Um, I think this is the second time I've heard that. Um, but, you know, I would love to, I would love to be a tenor. Uh, but it's just, that's not my path, I don't think. But you never know, right? I'm young, 32. So you never know what the voice does. I'm, you know, it's all about full of surprises. So yeah, if I become a tenor, hey, sign me up for that Wagner, okay? Sign me up. <laughs> so the judges have selected that I do both pieces. And I would like to begin with Swazi Mobile by Rossini from Guy Motel. Quasi-mobile, 
Selected Witness by Hall Johnson. O oh Lord, what manner of man is this? All nations in him are blessed. All things are done by his will. He spoke to the sea and the sea stood still. Now ain't that a witness for my Lord? Ain't that a witness for my Lord? Ain't that a witness for my Lord? So is a witness for my Lord. Now there was a man of the Pharisees. His name was Nicodemus and he didn't believe. The same came to Christ by night. Who wanted to be taught out of human sight. Nicodemus was a man desired to know how a man can be born when he is old. Christ told Nicodemus as a friend, man, you must be born again. Said, follow that man if you want to be wise. Repent, believe, and be baptized. Then you'll be a witness for my Lord. You'll be a witness for my Lord. You'll be a witness for my Lord. So is a witness for my Lord. Now you read about Samson from his birth, strongest man that ever lived on earth. Way back yonder in ancient times, he killed 10,000 of the Philistines. Then old Samson went wandering about. Samson's strength was never found out. Till his wife sat upon his knee. She said, tell me where your strength lies, if you please. Now Samson's wife, she talked so fair. Samson said, cut off of my hair. Shave my head just as clean as your hand. And my strength will come like a natural man. Samson was a witness for my Lord. Samson was a witness for my Lord. Samson he was a witness for my Lord. So is a witness for my Lord. There's another witness. Now there's another witness. There's another witness. My soul is a witness for my Lord. My soul is a Thank you so much. So just a quick round of applause from where you are while you're watching and listening. Uh, Kyle Walker is our accompanist today. So let's give him a quick hand clap there. If you're watching along from wherever you are, you can give him a hand clap. And just some reminders, if you're streaming this uh, via YouTube, if you're streaming this via Facebook on Harlem Presents, keep in mind that there is information um, to make donations. There are also uh, uh, links so that you can vote because there is an audience, cho audience choice uh, vote coming up. So you wanna make sure that you vote for your favorite performance. So you have that option on there. You can also continue to follow along with the program. And of course, be sure to share with your friends and family and you know, let them know we've got this wonderful show going on 
here uptown and they can you know follow along and watch with us as we continue on so we're going to go ahead and move this right along next up we've got adia evans who is a soprano My name is Adia Evans, and I will begin with I Am Moses the Liberator by Dr. Nkiru Okoye from the opera Harriet Tubman.
Nice. I wish I, wish I could do that. I, I, I can't do that. I wish I could. We've got the mic coming up. We're going to talk to you now. We know you are an amazing singer. Now, the thing that stood out to me is what you do when you're not on stage, uh, actually. So maybe the two have merged. I don't know. You tell me. So the question is, how, if at all possible, has um, your craft merged with your activism? So I understand you, you know, social justice is, a, is, is um, important to you. Um, that's a great question. Uh, I, I come from Baltimore, Maryland, and I have two artists for parents who, um, one is a visual artist and one is a dancer. And along with being amazing craftsmen, um, and artists in their own right, they gave back to um, their city where they came from. They really put, instilled in me um, a value for education um, and for giving back to your community. And so that was something that always um, was merged together in my mind, um, that that was a possibility to be an artist and someone who, who gives back and is a part of community service. And so that's always, um, been intermingled in my own personal life and that's something that I want to mingle in my professional life as well. Excellent. So um, times are a little different these days. We, you know, we're, it's a pandemic. You know, it is what it is. We're going to say it, call it what it is. Um, how has that affected you, if at all, um, you know, being able to, to do, your, you know, do your craft and use your, your talent? Um, it's difficult. It's difficult not to be on stage. Um, it's I, I wouldn't say t it's easy to take for granted, but it, it is something that um, collaboration and being around so many people is something that is a part of our craft um, that's intrinsic in what we do. And I miss hearing other people sing. I miss being a part of ensembles um, and making connections with other people. As you said, a part of the community service is working with people. And so I've seen a lot less people than I have this, um, this particular year. Um, and so it's pretty, it's pretty sad, but I'm, I'm glad to see opportunities like this happening. This is amazing. I, I was so excited to have an opportunity, especially at the end of the year, um, to wrap it up with some live music. <laughs> Excellent. What are our judges saying? Well, Adia, the judges would like to know your age. I'm 26 years old. 26. Well, when I was singing, they always said, if you don't want to sing Mozart, don't put it in your program because right. the judges will inevitably ask for <laughs> Mozart. So we're going to do them one up because we want to hear both pieces. So please okay. choose what you, in which order you would like to sing them. Excellent. Well, um, to begin with, I would like to perform Mozart. I will be uh, singing Come Scoglio from Così Fan Tutte by Mozart. And the second piece I'll perform is Soliloquy by John Work.
Thank you so much. 26, it's an amazing, um, an amazing voice. Um, and thanks again, Kyle Walker, you are doing an amazing job. <laughs> he, is our, he is our pianist for the afternoon and I'm just blown away. You are just keeping up with the folks here. You are doing an amazing job, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone tuning in via uh, live stream, whether you're watching through YouTube, whether you're watching through Facebook Live. Be sure to share with your friends and tell them to tune in and watch. We've got an amazing program for you today, so be sure to share that with folks. And also, you can vote for your favorite performer today. So be sure, because there is a audi an audience's choice award that will go out. So be sure to vote for your favorite today um, alongside, we'll also get our judges who will choose their, uh, the, the competition winner for today. So we're gonna go ahead and move the show right along. Uh, next up to the stage, we've got Christine Jobson, who is a soprano. by Margaret Bond. such a beautiful reminder for us this 2020. There's been so much loss and devastation and sadness and that's a, a gentle reminder that he's got the whole world, the whole world in his hands. Um, thank you so much for your selection. Um, a little birdie told me you went to Oakwood. Yes. I've got a little birdie watching you now, Dominic McKenzie, who is an old chum of yours from school. Oh. 
and he's tuning in. So be sure again to like, be sure to share, be sure to invite your friends, and of course, vote for your favorite performer today. That is an option you have because there is an audience choice award that goes out. So talk to me a little bit about, um, as I read your bio, and the thing that stood out to me is that there is uh, uh, an, an importance for you to preserve and publicize um, African-American vocal artists and, um, and music. Talk to me a little about the importance of that for you. Absolutely. Um, one thing that I'm very, very passionate about is representation. And I feel that to this point, uh, black people, black singers, black composers, we haven't been rightfully represented in the world of classical music. And so I do everything that I can to bring our music to the forefront. I try to perform it as much as possible. I've dedicated my research to it because I just think it's so important for young and old, everyone around the world to experience all different kinds of music and not just one side, one, one viewpoint of what classical music is. So you're talking about representation and in classical music, um, you know, it's not a space where we've seen um, representation with, you know, black people or people of color. And talk to me a little, about, a little bit about some of the maybe experiences you've had traveling. Um, you know, have you ever experienced racism? Have you ever experienced, you know, people treating you less than? Huh, that's a heavy question. Um, you know, I think I'll talk about the feeling of always being the only one. Mm. Uh, that happens a lot. You walk into a space and you, the first thing you notice is that you are the only person uh, of color who's in the room. So that alone can bring some anxiety. You, you may begin to wonder, what do people think of me? What do people think of my hair? What do people think of my skin color? What do people think about the style of clothes I wear? So many different variables that we think about as young people anyway, but just adding that extra layer of, of color and of race and of gender even, it can be, it can be a little intimidating sometimes. Even in the realm of academia, um, you may start to put extra pressure on yourself to perform at a very high level because you feel like you're representing your race. Um, you feel like any mistake that you make is a reflection of all black people, which we know is not true, but sometimes you can start to put that on yourselves. And even as simple as being asked to speak on behalf of black people in a class, well, I'm just one black person. My perspective may not be the perspective of all black people, but sometimes I am put in the position to kind of give the black opinion, which can be a little frustrating at times. Awesome. I, I, I want to go on, but I'm going to check with our esteemed judges first. Mr. Gregory Hopkins, do you, would you like to hear another selection? Thank you, Naomi. And thank you, Christine. We heard that you uh, went to Oakwood, yes. and we have to put a commercial out there because one of our past winners, Brandy Sutton, was another Oakwood graduate. There must be something in the water there. Yes, Brandy's amazing. So, uh, we would like to hear all of your numbers, please. Okay. Choose the order that you would like to sing them in. All right.
Exactly I'll sing De Fruit Le Jour from Louise by Charpentier.
Thank you, Christine. I just want to point out as we stand in these hallowed halls of the Harlem School of the Arts, which was founded by Dorothy Maynard, that was her signature aria. She sung it everywhere she went when she had an opportunity. So you pay homage to her lineage. Thank you so much. Awesome. As promised, like I said, you've got an amazing show lined up for you. Be sure to share, be sure to tell a friend to tune in and also to vote for your favorite entertainer, your favorite performer this evening. Right now, we've got a word from the uh, Harlem Opera Theater's board president, Ms. Edwina Myers Lynch. On behalf of the Board of Directors, thank you for joining us for this, the ninth Harlem Opera Theater Classical Voice Competition. Done this year in partnership with Harlem Presents. The pandemic has made this a challenging year. However, Harlem Opera Theater has had to raise its bar in order to meet that challenge. Thus, this year, we're coming to you virtually. Now, there is an upside to this, although different. There is an upside, and the upside is that we hope all of our regulars are on board, but also, we hope that this creates an opportunity for new folk to join us and to learn about Harlem Opera Theater and what it does. The mission of Harlem Opera Theater is to provide performance venues and opportunities for emerging and talented operatic singers to perform. The life journey of an operatic singer is long and difficult. Performance is what is needed in order to hone their skills. Competitions are special. Artists get an opportunity to perform before professional judges they're judged in their work. They also get an opportunity at Harlem Opera Theater to be judged by you. They get a chance also to meet other artists and to learn from each other. And finally, in this process, there is a financial reward. To help us continue our work, we definitely need your help and support on an ongoing basis. To donate to Harlem Opera Theater, there are several ways. One is through Eventbrite. The other is through our website, harlemoperatheater.org. And the third is to send it directly to Professor Gregory Hopkins, at Convent Avenue Baptist Church, 425 West 144th Street, New York City, 131. Any of those ways is fine. Now remember also, please vote for your favorite contestant tonight. You're in this process also. In addition, uh, I need to thank a, so a number of people who really made this happen. First, Gregory Hopkins, Artistic Director of Harlem Opera Theater, brilliant man, real genius, musical genius, and other things. Uh, Gregory Mays, founder of Harlem Presents. Nadal Benjamin, I call him a Zoom aficionado. He really worked so hard with us to make this happen. And 
Carol Brown. I maintain there are two Carols because she's everywhere doing everything all the time. But she's really the glue that holds this together, the fabric that weaves us all together and makes it all so pretty and nice. Thank you. for staying with us and uh, thank you for joining us today and if you're maybe just now tuning in uh, we hope you are going to stay to the end of the show and enjoy some of the uh, the wonderful entertainers we've got uh, lined up for the rest of this program um, we're going to go ahead and move the show right along and bring up our next performer Shanae Curtis she is a soprano <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
Nicely done. You've got a long list of, of I mean, just credits on credits on credits. And I feel like you know which one I'm going to ask you about. Maybe not. It says here you performed at Buckingham Palace. Oh, <laughs> yes. So tell, tell me a little bit about your experience at Buckingham Palace and how did that come about? And, what did you feel like? Tell me about it. It was amazing. I performed there when I went to the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama in Wales, um, which is uh, in the UK, uh, just south of like London. And I went there um, for a gala that Prince William threw for us for a fundraiser. Um, and it was slightly unexpected. I didn't know that we were going to go probably until a couple weeks before the event. Um, and I ended up singing Strauss um, Morgan with orchestra, and it was a really beautiful night, and he was so, so nice and so encouraging and really loves young singers and really loves just music in general, and it was really great to be a part of that night, which spearheaded a scholarship fund, which um, I was a recipient of, and many other people got to receive that award and go on to go to school and pay for many, many things after that. I mean, it was a great experience. It was really wonderful. Awesome. And awesome. it's nothing like walking in for the first time. I think <laughs> when I like walked in and the famous sort of velvet red carpets that line all the hallways, I think I thought I was in a storybook or something. <laughs> so it was really, really interesting doing that. But um, I'm grateful that I got the opportunity. That's excellent. So of your list of credits, what has been maybe one of your favorite um, you know, roles or one of your favorite pieces to perform? Favorite? Um, I, think I, I think a favorite experience more so than just the singing aspect of it. Um, I, it's hard to pick one so far, <laughs> but um, Buckingham Palace is pretty great. Um, the Met was awesome. Uh, I think Met Borgie, I mean, it was just such a historical um, production to be a part of and so many amazing artists. I mean, I think I'll never forget singing my first line and Denise Grace was standing right there. <laughs> and I just remember like the first time I sang it, I was like, oh my God. Um, but it was really amazing doing that. And I think after that, production wise, I really loved singing Alice Ford in um, Falstaff. I enjoyed that. Calorizzi conducted that when I was in Wales. And I just think Alice Ford is such a linchpin and just so much fun to do on stage. And up till then, I had done a lot of somber characters. So it was really fun to bring out like my fun side. Mm. So if I could do a role again, I'd love to do that somewhere else. But many wonderful experiences. I think I've been really blessed so far. Awesome. We'll check in with our judges and see what they'd like to hear. Mr. Hopkins? Well, our greedy judges would like to hear everything.
Thank you so much. I am so glad I am not a judge tonight because I don't even know <laughs> where I would start. Everyone sounds amazing. So thank you again if you are tuning in via live stream. We are streaming on YouTube. We're also streaming on um, Facebook. So be sure to share if you're watching along and invite other people to watch along with you. Um, we're going to go ahead and move the show right along. I always promise that I'm not going to be a long talker up here. And I, I hope I've kept my word for the evening. Um, we will go ahead. Let me just get my notes here and see where we are in our program. We are calling up Mr. Ron Dukes next. He is our next performer. He is a bass and we, he will be joining us on stage now. Hello everyone, my name is Ron Dukes and I would like to begin with Il Lacerato Spirito from Verdi Simon Bocconegra. Oh, 
Very nice. Thank you so much. Stay chat for a while. We'll get you a microphone. Thank you. Talk. Check. Hello. Uh, there you go. <laughs> microphone check. There you go. So I'm always curious to know, um, you know, how people got their start. What inspired them? These are, uh, you know, uh, some of the other contestants spoke about representation in this field, in this genre. And as a young black man, what inspired you to become a classical singer? Uh, well, uh, I was a football player prior to being a classical <laughs> uh, musician. Uh, so, you know, it's a little safer, uh, uh, fewer concussions. Um, in high school, uh, of course, I needed a fine arts credit to graduate. And so I enrolled in choir mm. uh, and I sang a few notes and the voice teacher said, go stand over here with the basses. Uh, and so I did that. And so at the end of that year, I was offered a scholarship to study voice lessons during the following summer. And that was my first exposure to classical music. Uh, I didn't know, you know, what a voice major even was, you, if, if you could even have a career uh, in singing. And I really fell in love with the art form. Uh, and I really have been doing it ever since. So. so now that you're part of this world, now that this is part of who you are, um, is there, what is, what's your goal? Is there a dream role that you have your eye on someday that you, you know, what is, what is the thing that, you're, that you would say hashtag goals to? Well, you know, I think any opportunity I get to sing and be paid is a wonderful thing. Come on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, as far as dream role, um, you know, I've always wanted to sing Ramfis and Aida. Mm. Uh, I love that, that piece, that role is really nice. Um, I just got done singing a role that I've always wanted to do at uh, IU Jacobs School of Music. I just got done singing Basilio uh, oh. in their production of Il Barbiere. Uh, so that was a really fun role. Uh, I wanted to do that role in particular because it's been, uh, that role is a bit of a stretch for me uh, technically. And so it allowed me to grow and explore a repertoire uh, that I haven't really uh, dove into uh, in much depth quite yet. So I was really thankful for that opportunity. Uh, and to make music during the pandemic was a really nice thing as well, so. As you mentioned the pandemic, um, you know, I talked with some of the other contestants who'd said, you know, they missed being, you know, part of, of, sh of shows and singing with other people and hearing other people sing. What, what's the experience been like for you? Uh, well, you know, it's just made me even more um, aware of the fact that collaborative music, making music with another breathing, living human being is a real gift that I took uh, for granted and that I'm finding, uh, I'm trying to extract every ounce of pleasure from it that I can whenever I get to do it nowadays. Uh, and so I'm very thankful uh, for this opportunity uh, and for this organization for putting this together. Um, yeah, I'm just very grateful for it. Awesome. We're going to check in with our judges, see where, what they'd like to hear. I'm surprised that you didn't mention Zarastro as one of your... Oh, yes. Yeah, I did that <laughs> recently as well. The judges would like to hear compensation, please. I will sing compensation. Excellent. Again, some gentle reminders for 
all of our friends who are live streaming this via YouTube or maybe through Facebook and you're sharing and you're voting for your favorite contestant of the evening as we roll our show on here at the Harlem School of the Arts at the Herb Alpert Center. Be sure to, if you can, donate. If you can, vote for your favorite uh, performer and continue to follow along with our program for this afternoon. And of course, share and like and tell all your friends to come and tune in. We're gonna go right along here and bring up our next performer, Ariana Rodriguez, and she is a soprano. Good afternoon, my name is Ariana Rodriguez and today, afternoon, I would like to start with Senza Mamma from Puccini's Suor Angelica.
Long a chance to the last person again, if that's okay. Um, Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's a little dry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Where would you like me to start from? We've got a mic coming up for you. You'll stay, you'll chat for a bit. So I understand you accidentally discovered classical music. Tell me a little bit about that. Um, I was in choir, but I got into musical theater and I was like, oh my gosh, musical theater is my life. <laughs> it was not, um, I was not very good at it. So my voice teacher was like, well, maybe you should try like classical music or jazz. And I would refuse to sing classical music. She was like, don't you want this nice little Italian <laughs> art song? And I said, no, I don't. Mm. So um, I, I applied to George Mason with the intention of switching over to the vocal jazz program. But there I met my teacher, Professor, Sam, oh, Professor Samuel Bonds at George Mason. And he was like, you're doing classical music now. And I was still resistant, but I had some friends who introduced me to some amazing artists and I discovered like all of the soprano repertoire and I realized that it's like the same except you get to sing everything except like without dialogue in comparison to musical theater. Yeah. So tell me, so you found something in the genre that kept you. Yeah. You found something that kept you. What, what about it moved you? And kept you? I think I just really love the music and I love the stories and I love the fact that like the the voice continues the expression of the entire piece like mm. you have recit and then you have arias and you have choruses and duets and it's just like constant singing all the time and I don't know just like getting to do that all the time with other people means a lot to me personally like mm. I just really enjoy that aspect of music which makes quarantine super hard <laughs> and that's that's that was going to be my next question you've you know you had an opportunity here today to see other performers and I mean what has this experience been like for you 2020 um who isn't you know yeah. someone who collaborates with others what has this been like for you um well being here has been great I I was talking to my mom before I left and I was like I can't wait to see live music I'm so excited <laughs> um so it's just been really nice to hear so many amazing artists throughout the night and to just to be here and share this stage with them. So yeah, that's been really exciting. Awesome. I'm going to check in with the judges and see what they're saying. Okay. Very unusual request for you. We would like to hear the recit of okay. the Mozart and then to the second half. And then the second half, the fast section. Okay. Yes. Awesome and long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I will be singing selections of Dove Sono. And we want to hear the spiritual also. And then the spiritual. <laughs>
Thank you so much. I've got to tell you, our judges are, they've, they've got some work to do tonight. They have got some work to, and they look really cool with their masks on as I'm watching them off camera there deliberating. Very cool. Um, we've got one more, one more um, contestant for this evening's competition. Um, but before I move forward, just a quick thank you again to Kyle Walker, who was our accompanist this evening. Um, you know, he accompanied most of um, this evening's performers, so a quick hand around for, for him, just from our, our folks right here. And if you're watching at home, you can clap for him from home also, that's fine. Um, coming up next, we've got Markle Reed. He's a baritone, and his accompanist will be Walker Jackson. <laughs> begin with Herme Junto from Don Carlo by Verdi.
we're going to get a, micro, a microphone for you up here. For everything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I'm loving the judges right now. The judges are giving me everything. <laughs> Because it, it, it just gives us more time to enjoy all of your voices just a little bit longer. So it really is you know, quite the treat. Um, talk to us a little bit about how, when you were exposed to classical music and what made you choose that path. Certainly. So I uh, was exposed to classical music in high school. Um, originally, I planned on going the route of engineering. Uh, the last semester of high school, I had a music and drama teacher who, and who had been encouraging me throughout high school. Um, I had the same one, and she uh, gave me a, a, an art song in Italian and told me that I should just learn it, you know, just in case. And um, some things went awry when it came to like science, and I realized like I don't really want to do this. <laughs> um, and so I took that piece of music called Seben Crudele. And I, I started auditioning with it um, at a local school as well as um, at Oakwood College, um, not Oakwood University. And I got in and I decided that I was going to go for music education, um, which is a wonderful, like I wanted to teach. And once I got there, I worked with my teacher and they encouraged me actually to adjust from um, specifically education to performance. Um, because I could do the same things um, with, the, with the degree that I, specifically that I wanted to do. So that was my exposure to classical music and I learned about opera once I got to college. Mm. So. so talk to me a little bit about what, you know, how it moves you and what that looks like for you. So music in its, in its expression, um, I think it's all about intention. Uh, you, you can learn the notes on the page, you can learn, if you're a vocalist, you can learn how to shape the vowels, how to make sure everything flows the way it's supposed to, but if there's no meaning behind it, if there's no heart behind it, it, it kind of falls flat, in my opinion. Um, I'm all about connecting with whatever's being expressed, and if I don't feel like you're actually expressing, if I don't feel like I'm expressing, then it also falls flat. Um, so I, I, would, I think that's my answer to that, yeah, it's all about intention for me. So uh, the judges said they want to hear everything. I'll leave you Certainly. to it. Thank you. The judges have selected that I sing. Oh, sorry. Everything. Um, so I will, um, for my second piece, I will sing. <laughs> from um, Tan Wars by Wagner, O du mein Holder Abendstern. Und grausen Bahn. 
For my last and final piece, I will sing Dream Variation by Marvin Bonds. Thank you so much. Judges, you've got quite, uh, quite the job this evening. Thank you all so much for joining us. We're not done just yet. We've still got a little bit of program, a little bit of something for you uh, this afternoon as we go into the evening here at the Harlem School of the Arts at the Herb Alpert Center. Um, but just some gentle reminders that um, we do accept donations and you'll see links to that and links for that um, in the description sections of the YouTube feed or on the Facebook feed. You'll see that um, in the description section again, we're accepting donations. You can also go there and get the links to make, uh, to cast your vote for your favorite performer this evening. There is an audience choice vote happening, so be sure to cast your vote uh, before the evening is done. Right now, we've got quite the treat. Um, we've got the 2017 Vocal Competition winner, Karami Hilaire. She's joining me on stage this evening. We're gonna have a chat and she's going to tell me plenty of things. It's gonna be wonderful. So stay with us as I join, um, join Ms. Hilaire on stage here. Social distance, you see it, right? We're social distancing. We gotta make sure that you know, we stay safe, we keep you safe. We wanna make sure that you, know, you keep the folks at home safe that you're going home to. So we're gonna keep it safe over here. And I always like to start um, interviews with classical performers with what made you choose this genre of music? What drew you to it? What inspired you? Maybe it was a teacher, maybe, you know, just hearing it one day. So please. I think for me, I grew up in a Haitian household. We listened to compa. My dad liked classical music, but we didn't really listen to it. Mm. So for me, it wasn't until I started um, studying jazz um, that at the school that I was at, my, we were required, take, studying jazz, we were required to also take classical lessons. And so I was just learning classical technique and I just, I kind of, I had a knack for it. Um, and so that's how I really, I started to realize that it was very satisfying. Mm -hmm. It was satisfying in terms of the storytelling 
um, that you could, you could experience not only musically, but within the text that you were singing, so many shades of the human experience and so many different kinds of emotions. Um, I just kept wanting to go there. Of course, I don't, I haven't, I never stopped singing jazz and now I'm at a point where I'm realizing you can find a lot of similarities to that in jazz, mm -hmm. but, in, but in opera, if you're a nerd about singing, you're just gonna wanna learn the most difficult way to sing, mm. you know? You're, you're just gonna wanna test to the utmost of your ability. Mm. So it's, it's about pushing yourself a little bit for It you. is about that ambition, that, that drive to just, how well can I do something that's, in, that's very difficult? So what's the <laughs> hardest you think you've ever pushed yourself in preparation for something, let's say? Oh. <laughs> so in preparation, I, it's, you know, it's like, it's usually because someone's like, can you learn this in a few days? Mm. And then you just have to sit down and get it done. But I mean, there's so much science involved in how you use your body when you sing. Mm. I have to say the hardest I ever worked for that, I had like a three day audition mm. for the role of Lady Macbeth. Mm. And I, that role is just so difficult to sing. <laughs> it's like mentally difficult because mm. you know it's difficult, mm -hmm. so you always kind of want to give up on yourself mm -hmm. while you're doing it, but Lady Macbeth would never give up on herself. There you go. <laughs> so you're always, you're just pushing, 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 and then the aria's over and you can collapse somewhere backstage, but yeah, that, I think it was that, that three day, like coaching for this role, mm -hmm. extra, extravaganza that I had. Nice. It was just, I got the role. There you go. Of course, the Rona. <laughs> Well, here we are, right. Delayed it, but... Well, we're going to pick <laughs> back up, no worries. We'll one day at a time, up. we're going to pick back up. So you mentioned um, your Haitian background, mm -hmm. and uh, as, as a Congolese person, a, a lot of times our parents want us to be doctors and lawyers. You know, we, I heard classical music growing up in my home, and that was the norm for me, but, you know, it wasn't mm -hmm. that... I w it wasn't so much of go chase that dream of the arts or anything like that. I think because mm -hmm. I think I tried to be a music major. I can't sing. I don't know what I was doing. <laughs> Luckily, my mom was in there like, nah, this is not for you. <laughs> but what was that like in your home? Were you encouraged? <laughs> did you did they have to come around a little bit? Well, OK, so my my dad was always like, maybe you'll <laughs> since you're in college, you'll be inspired by other things mm. and want to do science. <laughs> he was, he never, he never really thought that I should pursue music. Mm. Um, but my mom really was always super supportive. She's like, you should definitely go for it. And, and you should also be a nurse, mm. but never stop pursuing that as hard as you're pursuing it, but also be a nurse. Um, so, you know, it's like, it's one of those things where she really supports it, but also wants me to be a nurse at the so same are time. You, are you a singing nurse? <laughs> <laughs> they exist. I'm not one. No. Yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you, men you mentioned Miss Rona. Um, you know, I, I feel like that's the elephant in every room. Anytime you know folks gather safely or not, I imagine uh, it's topic of conversation. Mm -hmm. Just what's what has that experience been like for you? Has it? I'm obviously it slowed your work. How has that affected you? Well, it definitely slowed a lot of work. Um, at the, also, I was in a digital opera. So mm -hmm. it's also given, it's given me the opportunity to engage in musical experiences that aren't the norm, mm -hmm. to connect with audiences in different ways. So that's been, that's been interesting. And I wonder how that will continue to develop Talk to me about that digital opera a little bit. That sounds like an interesting concept. It's something, you know, we're, we're learning new ways of doing mm -hmm. things. Talk to me a little bit about that. A lot, well, right now, most operas that are happening are, at least in the US, are happening in a digital way, either pre-recorded, usually pre-recorded. I was, the opera that I was in was live. Mm. Um, it took place from my bedroom, I was, it was called Alice in the Pandemic. Mm. I was Alice. I got. I was a nurse that got home from a long day of just being an emergency room nurse, mm. and and then things just start 
going nuts. So the whole thing took place in my room. I had a green screen in my room. I had to sing lying in my bed. At one point, it was a very interesting experience. Do your neighbors ever just hear you singing and they're just so, like, hey lady, keep it down? <laughs> my next door neighbors think I'm like the best singer they ever heard, so they're fine. And uh, the people who live upstairs, you know, they, they're fine. <laughs> they've never complained. And now they, they've moved. So. <laughs> they're no longer <laughs> so <factors. it's> fine. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, what is that? Is, does it, I, I imagine it doesn't sound the same, you know, performing it at home as it would, you know, on a so, stage. So um, it's really different. <laughs> it's really different. I mean, so the orchestra is pre-recorded. That was really different because usually in all the roles that I've sang in the past, um, I get so much from the orchestra. Mm. Like I hear the violins and I just with they just I can't I guess I've never attempted to articulate how a voice integrates itself with the orchestra and how important it is, how much how much support you get from listening to the, especially the string instruments. I mean, so that was definitely missing for me. Mm. Um, it was just in my ear pre-recorded orchestra. Um, so there were a lot of aspects that were different that way. Mm -hmm. But, um, and it's really hard to support the way you would normally support for hardcore singing. Mm. When you're on a soft bed or when you're sitting in a, a you know, an office chair. So, so do, is it is it harder to to hit the notes? Maybe because you know, you, I feel like there's a little bit of posture involved. Um, it's well, it's a new opera, so the composer didn't make it so that I wouldn't. He didn't write anything that I couldn't do. Okay. With the <laughs> with the direction I was given. Um, but yeah, I would say there are ways around it with technique. Mm. But yeah, it it's just different. Hearing yourself in the hall creates a totally different experience than hearing yourself through a head, headset, mm. you know? Right. So uh, you have a long list of credits. Uh, you've been performing for some time. What has been your favorite role, let's say, or, you know, your favorite song or and why? Okay. Well, I really liked, I was thinking about this the other day. Okay. I really liked singing Tosca. Mm. And I think that when I sing, if I get the chance to sing Tosca again, I'll play the role a little differently. Mm. But it's just a lot of fun to play someone who is, um, man, she really does <laughs> kill. Like, I mean, that whole second act mm -hmm. when she kills a man with her bare hands, I just had so much fun doing that. Does that so does it allow you to just kind of maybe step out of yourself? Or is that is that type of role different than who you are? Would yeah, you, well, yeah. Is she that, a little bit like you? All, that's interesting. I don't think I've ever... I had to bring exactly who I am to every single performance. Mm. Um, so all the characters I've played are very much like me because I can't step out of my personality when I play these roles. Mm. Um, I, I don't know if I would have the gumption to uh, kill a man with my bare hands <laughs> right. the way she did, um, but I just respect it. I just respect it. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I think she had a lot of mercurialness to her personality that it was fun to lean into. Mm. So that was, I think that was it for me. Did I answer your question? Or? I did. Okay. So let's. So if is there a goal, a hashtag goals, <laughs> song or character or you know play that you what what, what is your hashtag goals part um, that you would like? <laughs> That's a good question because I'm I'm in crisis with it right now. I always wanted to sing Violetta, mm. and <laughs> now I'm. You know. I'm just sort of realizing that my voice will probably never fully do that. 
Um, <laughs> so I have to like <laughs> reassess what my goals are. And also now that we have such a political consciousness mm -hmm. of what a lot of these characters mean, I used to want to sing Madam Butterfly too. And now I'm like, I don't really want to sing Madam Butterfly. Mm. Um, I used to, I mean, I hope I'm, you know, I'm torn about Aida. Mm. I used to, I used to really want to sing Aida. I got the chance to sing it. And I was until very recently in a place where I was like, I would love to sing that again. Mm -hmm. But now I'm just like, you know, now that all of our political consciousness is expanding around these opera characters, mm -hmm. it's just not the same anymore to, which, to have which, there. which, Let's mm -hmm. say maybe which character do you think affected you in that way the most, where you were just like, you know what, this was something I used to want to do now, not so much, and why? It's so interesting. I feel this way about so many characters right mm. now. I feel this way about Donna Anna. I feel this way about Liu. Um, characters from Turandot. Um, I used to want to sing Liu, then I wanted to sing Turandot. Mm -hmm. But that whole opera. Give us a little bit of background for those who, for, for our folks who maybe aren't familiar. It's an opera written by Puccini that takes place in <laughs> what the Met opera calls the mythical past, mm -hmm. which is just like a racist fantasy for what, you know, Peking or wherever it, I can't fully remember the name of the city that they're in, what it mm -hmm. must be like back then. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a lot of Orientalism coming mm -hmm. right at you mm -hmm. with that opera. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really uncomfortable to watch. It's really uncomfortable. And the music is really striking. Mm -hmm. So there's a dichotomy there that's uncomfortable um, that we all have to sit in as classical musicians, mm -hmm. for sure. So we, 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 we talked about this with some of uh, the other contestants mm -hmm. this evening, uh, just talking about representation in this space, representation in classical music. Yeah. And, um, you know, there is a very clear, you know, changing of the times. Have, have you ever encountered uh, maybe racism in the field or, you know, being in spaces where you're the only black woman or the only black person in general and that sort of thing. Huh. And how does it make you feel if you're I ever mean, in those spaces? I mean, you know, I, that is par for the course. Mm. I don't think any black person enters a classical conservatory and trains to the heights that we've all trained to and has not experienced some form of othering. Mm. So all those things are just like par for the course. What I'm kind of interested in now is, <laughs> so this is kind of a, this is a difficulty within mm. what we all experience as classical musicians. Mm -hmm. But I would like us to Acknowledge firstly that it's this this European art form part of why it's so loved in Europe is the whiteness, mm -hmm. right? Like that's a part of <laughs> what makes it so appealing to Europeans, mm -hmm. and that's why the Met has to do, you know deal with these questions about diversity the way they're always asked to deal with these questions about diversity and why so little changes is because they like the whiteness of it. Mm. So, I mean, accepting this as classical performers puts us in this position of knowingly trying to integrate a space, mm. um, knowing that we have so many things of value to offer to that space that is, that is like pretty, comfortable in its anti-blackness. Um, so I don't know if I just started uh, tirating or if that actually answered your question, no, but those are my feelings about it. It absolutely <laughs> did. Now I see, I see our judges are done deliberating, um, but, they'll, so, but they'll give us just a little bit longer to chat. Um, so we, you talked, we talked a little bit about, you know, I guess, um, social, social justice topics and 
what it's like to be, you know, filling these spaces and what it's like growing up in a Haitian household where, you know, you were in encouraged to, to be a nurse. Uh, you know, as opposed to going into the arts. Still being encouraged <laughs> to be a nurse. We've talked about you. you still live, are, but you're, you're playing one now, right? right. You're, you're kind of playing one now. So you're, you're, you're kind of fulfilling the dream. Will, yeah, they, you're right. will, they, will they accept that answer? Will your parents accept <laughs> that answer? Tell them I said, listen, you're kind of playing right. the role right now. So you're, you, you kind That's of got it done. So funny. You're, you're right. <laughs> So we're, we're, I'm going to continue to talk about a little bit more about uh, representation. Um, do you think it's changed over maybe the last five or 10 years? Do you feel like maybe just the conversations are happening more? Do you feel that there have been actual changes? That is so fascinating. I'm so fascinated by that question because, because, mm, the world of opera seems to relent just a little bit. Like, black people gain some ground, usually in response to, to huge social justice movements. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like this little, like, sliver of space is made for us <laughs> in the, grand, you know, in the world where, like, people have money and are doing productions. Um, and it's, it's very interesting. So I, I think in response to a lot of social justice movements, a lot of predominantly white institutions that put on operas are interested in, in being a part of the question of like, what do we do with, how do we, how do we handle what we're being asked to do, which is mm -hmm. integrate our art form, which we like to be white. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of people are finally starting to talk about that. Um, how much it will change, it seems to be a trend to me. There seems to be moments where people are like, yes, let's get, you know, let's do the moral thing and get black people on stage. But then they get people, they get black people on stage and then they do something like Porgy and Bess, which is written by a black, I mean, <laughs> written by a white person libretto created after studying a black community. There was no black input in how these black people were to be seen. Not that there's nothing wrong with Porgy and Bess. I mean, it's an amazing opera um, and people who do it should be proud to do it. Um, but there is something uncomfortable. There's something that we have to, something uncomfortable that we have to sit in when we perform that opera. Um, and <laughs> I would love to see less surface area adjustment and more depth to the adjustments. I'd like to see hair and makeup people that know how to deal with like black people mm -hmm. and textured hair and dark skin. I would love to see, I would love to work with a black director. I've never, I can't believe I've never worked with a black director. Mm. Black conductors exist. All these like really interesting artists have so much to offer, but these institutions that are having the conversations are hiring black performers to perform operas where a white person, with a white person's vision for who we are. Mm. So I'm not really sure where the conversation leads or where, I'm not really sure. I, I'm interested to see what happens, but I, I can't say that I'm convinced that the willingness to acknowledge and have this conversation now means that they're less in love with the idea of opera remaining as white as it is and as it always has been. So what's next for you? Well, good question. <laughs> because, you know, as an artist in this time, half the time I'm like, who cares about <laughs> what I'm doing? <laughs> and half the time I'm like, yeah, let's work, let's work. So what's next? I mean, I'm still doing Lady Macbeth. I'm still doing Cosmic Cowboy with White Snake Opera Projects and the Lady Macbeth will be with Knoxville Opera. It's just gonna happen at some point in 2021 um, when more people are vaccinated and all that. There we have it. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for your time and sharing you know, with us this, this evening. Uh, and it looks like our judges are done deliberating.
and I can go ahead and turn that over to Mr. Gregory Hopkins, and he will bring up uh, and talk with our with us a little bit about uh, what's going on this evening. I'd like to invite all of our judges to the stage and all of our artists to the stage as well. While they are coming, let me first say that 2020 has been a particularly challenging year for performers and for performing arts organizations. And Harlem Opera Theater is no exception. We, like most performing arts groups, have had to alter our season cancel performances, and reimagine the things that we're doing. So we thank you for being a part of this, our first virtual vocal competition. It's been momentous and historic. We want to thank our great audience, those of you who are tuning in on Facebook and YouTube. Without audiences, the, audi the artists would have no one to sing to or for. You are a very important part of the program. I would like to say thanks to Harlem Presents. And there's always something dangerous about anybody that is named Greg. <laughs> Greg Mays, thank you. Thank you to the Harlem School of the Arts. We're standing in this beautiful ed edifice that has recently been remodeled and reconfigured. So it's coming to life just like we are going to come to life after the pandemic. This is one of the first events to be held in the newly refurbished Harlem School of the Arts. We would like to thank our pianist, Kyle Walker. Where are you, Kyle, for, for being such a great assist to these artists? And Nadal, who is our technical person. All of your gifts have come to fruition in your work with us here today. Harlem Opera Theater would be nothing without the hard work of people like Carol Brown, who work day in and day out behind the scenes. Thank you, Carol Brown. And a special salute to our board president, who is in Virginia nursing her ailing sister. We love you, Edwina, and wish you could be here. I would like to now introduce our very esteemed judges. You heard the singing, so you know they had a tremendous job. Mark Shapiro is a six-time ASCAP Award winner. He's the music director for the Prince Edward Island Symphony and E. Cantori, as well as the Cecilia Chorus, both here in New York City. Malcolm Merriweather. Grammy-nominated conductor and singer who is the music director for the New York City Dessoff Choirs. And Damien Sneed, recording artist, pianist, organist, conductor, arranger. He has performed with the likes of Aretha Franklin, Jesse Norman, Stevie Wonder, most recently, he was the Houston Grand Opera's cover conductor and artistic artist in residence. Let's hear it for our three judges. And now the moment that you all have been waiting for. Drum roll. <laughs> the audience choice. That's the one you chose. Adia. <laughs> the judge's choice for the third place, Markel. <laughs> and the judge's choice for the second place, Adia. And last but not least, the first place winter for the 2020 Harlem Opera Theater Virtual Vocal Competition, Shanae.
because we're all smiling behind these masks. Even the ones that didn't win first, second, third, or audience choice were great. And we know that all of you are going to have tremendous careers. Keep up the great work. Remember that Harlem Opera loves you and that we're behind you every step. We're going to take you with us, and we want you to take us with you wherever you go. God bless you all, and thank you for being a part of this glorious evening.